Hello, I'm Jeremy Vine, and this is Panorama. We had a picture, and now we have a name, Peter. And I got to say sorry too, you know. I should have been there for him. I should have been. I was, but I wasn't allowed to be there. Social workers have been sacked, ministers have acted, and reports have been written. Had that been disclosed, there is a very good chance, in my judgment, that that little boy would now still be alive. Here in his own home, baby Peter should have been safe. His is a story of neglect, abuse, missed opportunities, then national outrage. His ribs were cracked, his back broken, 50 injuries scarring a tiny body. His mother didn't protect him, she lied and lied to hide the boyfriend who abused her son. Social workers, doctors and police didn't manage to protect him either, even though they knew he was at risk. There isn't the evidence for anyone to lose their job. If there was, that would have happened. There was no sorry. Haringey Council said it did all it could. But this tragedy ignited the anger and distress of strangers. Many professionals failed Baby P, but the spotlight fell on the usual suspects, the social workers. This is a story about a social services department that gets £100 million pounds a year and can't look after children. Yeah. That's what this is about. In Haringey, within weeks, there were sackings, resignations, and the words, sorry. We are truly sorry that we did not do more to protect him. It is our first duty in government and as a society to do all we can to keep our children safe. I've been to meet Peter's grandma. This is the first time she's spoken on television. She says social workers asked her about a man her daughter described as just a friend. She told them what she could with her daughter listening upstairs. But she did tell me not to mention the boyfriend. What I did say was, he's there more often than me. Matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised if he had moved in. Because I wasn't 100% sure. Because that time, all his stuff wasn't in there at that time. You understand? It's only after this that he moved in properly. Each time a child like Peter dies, we hear the words, never again. But how much confidence can we have that the same mistakes won't be made in the future? If you ask me the question, is there any reason at the moment to think that the rate of child deaths is going to be any less than 30 years time than it was 30 years ago? The answer is no. Hi guys! So the word for today's video is portocaliu. 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 Well done guys! You just said orange! Okay. The reason why I started uh, this video the way that I started is because this case is just heartbreaking and I was really struggling to actually, you know, get the research done into the case and uh, deciding to actually talk about it because I received the request to cover the video, to cover this case since last year, I believe, in 2021 and I just... I just couldn't get myself to doing it and even now as I did my as I prepared for for the coverage of the case it honestly took me maybe even more than one week to get my research together because I had to keep on stopping and give myself a couple of hours break or a day break because it's just it's horrendous to say the least and uh, I'm going to start the video by giving my usual disclaimer. I don't mean any disrespect to anyone I talk about in the video. This video is for educational purposes only and all the information I'm giving you is already found in the public domain. And apart from that, I'll also be giving my opinions uh, around the case. Thank you so much. And also guys, trigger warning. This case is about extremely brutal which resulted in the death of a baby so if this is not something that you would uh, want to watch then I can understand and I will see you in the next video 
and uh, also I won't be able to be very very graphic in the way that I describe things for obvious reasons because of YouTube and because of the um, of the demonetization issues I also won't be able to show any graphic photos for the same reasons I will try the best I can to describe what happened to this baby without being too graphic about it okay thank you guys so much so let's let's get started brace yourselves because this is just it's very it's very hard to swallow baby p also known as child a was a 17 month old british boy who was killed in london in 2007 after suffering more than 50 injuries over an eight month period during which he was repeatedly seen by the London Borough of Herringy, Children's Services and National Health Service, NHS Health Professionals. A court order issued by the High Court in England prevented the publication of the identity of baby P. However, this was lifted on 1st of May 2009 by Justice Coleridge. We now know that baby P or child A or baby Peter is Peter Connolly. An order requested by Herringy Council to stop publication of the identities of his mother and her boyfriend was granted, but this expired on 10th of August 2009. And I'm gonna say it again. This is a horrific case of child abuse, pure horror inflicted on a defenseless baby boy, all under the eyes of his mother, the same woman that said she had no idea that her baby was being abused to death. And yet again, social services, the police and the National Health Service turned a blind eye and essentially allowed baby Peter's death. So let's get into all of the details. I know that it's not easy to talk about these things. I know that you might be triggered by this story, but as hard as it is to hear, I think that we owe this much to an innocent life lost at the hands of those who should have protected him. And just imagine, if it's triggering for you, how was it for the baby? How was it for baby P? How was it for the source of your trigger? Because we are on the other side of it and all we can do at this point is to pay our respects to a baby and listen to their story. Peter Connolly was born to Tracy Connolly on 1st of March 2006. His biological father left the family home just a few months after he was born. In November, Tracy's new boyfriend, Stephen Barker, moved in with her and baby Peter. In December, a general practitioner noticed bruises on Peter's face and chest. His mother was arrested and Peter was put into the care of a family friend, but he then returned home to his mother's care in January 2007. Over the next few months, Peter was admitted to hospital on two occasions, suffering from injuries, including bruising, scratches, and swelling on the side of the head. Tracy Connolly was arrested again in May 2007, just a few months after baby Peter was returned to her care. In June 2007, a social worker observed marks on Peter and informed the police. A medical examination concluded that the bruising was the result of child abuse. On 4th of June, the baby was placed with a friend for safeguarding. On 25th of July, Herringy Council's Children and Young People Service obtained legal advice which indicated that the threshold, the threshold for initiating care proceedings was not met. Just, guys, just pay attention to this. The threshold for initiating care proceedings was not met. Now, this makes me feel as if we are talking about an object which doesn't meet the criteria. It's like a test on a piece of paper and you don't really get the results that you pass the test, right? Is it really a computer that tells us when a child is in danger? Is this a glimpse into the future? Because if it is, God help all of these children, seriously. On, on 1st of August 2007, Peter was seen at St. Anne's Hospital in North London by local pediatrician Sabah Al-Zayat. 
Serious injuries, including a broken back and broken ribs, very likely went undetected as the post-mortem report believed that these injuries predated the pediatrician's examination. One day later, Tracy, the mom, was informed that she would not be prosecuted. I mean, well done, a pat on the back, Tracy, right? Now you can, you know, just carry on. The next day, an ambulance was called and baby Peter was found in his cot, blue and wearing only a nappy. After attempts to resuscitate him, he was taken to North Middlesex Hospital with his mother, our lovely beloved Tracy, but sadly, baby Peter was pronounced dead at 12.20 p.m. A post-mortem examination revealed that he had swallowed a tooth after being punched. Other injuries included a broken back, broken ribs, mutilated fingertips, and missing fingernails. Like seriously, missing a whole fingernail. The police immediately began a murder investigation and baby Peter's mother was arrested. Because... Yes, I guess we have to wait for a murder to happen for the police to take action because the previous injuries and hospital visits were not enough, were they? Nope, we need to wait for baby Peter to die before we wake up and we decide, let's arrest Tracy yet again, but this is not even all. And if you think that justice was served, then you are so, so mistaken. On 11th of November, 2008, 36-year-old Owen and his brother Stephen Barker, 32 years old, Tracy's boyfriend, were found guilty of causing or allowing the death of a child or vulnerable person. Tracy had already pleaded guilty to this charge. Earlier in the trial, Owen and Tracy had been cleared of murder because of insufficient evidence. Stephen Barker, on the other hand, was found not guilty of murder by a jury. A second trial took place in April 2009 when Tracy Connolly and Stephen Barker, under aliases, because you know it's very important to protect murderers, they faced charges related to the rape of a two-year-old girl. Now, remember, this two-year-old girl was not baby Peter. The girl was also on Herringe's child protection register. Stephen Barker was found guilty of while Tracy was found not guilty of child cruelty charges. Their defense lawyers argued that this second trial was nearly undermined by bloggers publishing information linking them to the death of baby Peter, which could have prejudiced the jury. I mean, oh my God, you know, talk about ridiculous defenses. Now you get to the point where you blame bloggers for influencing a jury of a murder case of a child who died from horrific injuries. Seriously, is this what's most the most important influence, the jury being influenced? I don't get it. Sentencing for both trials together took place on 22nd of May 2009 at the Old Bailey. Tracy Connolly received the sentence of indefinite imprisonment for public protection, subject to a minimum term of Five years, yes, a minimum term of five years, five years. Stephen Barker was sentenced to life imprisonment for rape with a minimum sentence of 10 years and a 12-year sentence for his role in the death of baby Peter to run concurrently, meaning at the same time. So basically, Stephen Barker, who raped a two-year-old girl and he was involved in the death of baby Peter, received a minimum sentence of 10 years, guys. 10 years, he was eligible for parole in 2017. Owen, Stephen's brother, was also jailed indefinitely with a minimum term of 3 years. That's a joke. That is a complete joke. And I, and I agree with that and all of you agree with that as well. I assume everybody agrees with that. The sentences were also criticized as too lenient by the NSPCC's chief executive and the attorney general even considered referring them to the court of appeal for review, but concluded that there was no realistic prospect of the court of appeal increasing the sentences. The three human 
thirds appealed against their sentences, Stephen Barker even appealed against both convictions and sentences as well. Not only was Owen's sentence, Stephen, Stephen's brother, a minimum of only three years, and let's say, you know, with a bit of luck indefinitely, but after the appeal, this was changed to a fixed six-year term. He was released in August 2011. Yes, he was released, but then he was later recalled to prison. Tracy Connolly was released on license in 2013, but she returned to prison in 2015 for breaching her parole. She became ineligible for review for two years. Stephen Barker had an application for parole turned down in August 2017. Tracy Connolly was refused, was refused parole for a third time in December 2019. Okay, so I'm getting ahead of myself here because uh, you know what, my, my blood is just boiling, you guys. Let's just, let's just, you know, take a quick look at the timeline and then, and then guys, trigger warning for the rest of this video, we are getting deep into the details here. Although I can't be very graphic, like I mentioned, there will still be quite a few details there. So, on 1st of March 2006, baby Peter is born. On 13th of October 2006, baby Peter is taken to the GP, the doctor, with bruises. His mother, Tracy, claims that he fell down the stairs. On 11th of December 2006, the same year that baby P was born, he is placed on the child protection register after the GP spots a head injury and bruises. The mother, Tracy, we can't even call her that, but uh, okay, she is arrested, right? On 22nd of January 2007, Peter, baby Peter, returns to his mother. In February, Nevres Kemal, a former Herringy social worker, writes to the Department of Health with concerns. On 22nd of March 2007, Paulette Thomas, a health visitor, reports no concerns after the check. On 7th of April 2007, Peter is admitted to hospital, just a few weeks after the health visitor reports no concerns. On 1st of June 2007, baby Peter is to be supervised by a friend after an unannounced social worker visit. On 30th of July 2007 is the last social worker visit. Peter's bruises are covered in chocolate. On 1st of August 2007, Peter is taken to hospital, but no full examination is done as he is described as being, wait for it, cranky. Really? Is baby Peter cranky or a baby in pain with a broken back, broken ribs near death? Because only two days later, on 3rd of August 2007, baby Peter dies and he was cranky. <sighs> on 11th of November 2008, Owen and Barker are found guilty of causing the death of baby Peter. Tracy Connolly pleads guilty. This is a very short timeline of the very short life of baby Peter. The semi-detached house in which Peter Connolly, baby Peter Connolly, spent the last hours of his very short life is nothing noticeable. Situated on Penshurst Road in Tottenham with bay windows and a side door, it doesn't really stand out, you know, and it's just a few minutes from the Tottenham Hotspur football ground. You wouldn't really have any reason to give it a second look, and this is exactly what the locals did. Out of the neighbors, only a Polish man even noticed the family living at the end of the street. They seemed like good people. Some of the other residents had only recently moved into the street and the rest couldn't really remember their previous neighbors. At one time, the residents of number 37 included a young woman, her four small children, a muscular man, his brother and his brother's three children and 15-year-old girlfriend, three large dogs and a few snakes. The family were also white and of Anglo-Irish origin, unlike their neighbors, 
who come from Africa, the subcontinent and Eastern Europe. It's safe to say that this was, you know, a mixed race neighborhood, very typical to how you would see in the capital in London and of course elsewhere as well. Even if they didn't really draw attention to themselves, there is no doubt that the ethnic difference struck Stephen Barker and his brother Jason Owen. Jason had been a member of the National Front, which is a far-right fascist political party in the UK. Stephen, on the other hand, was obsessed with Nazis. Even, even so, they were still just a couple of strangers, you know, passing through a disconnected and ever-changing community. That's the story of London boroughs like Herringy, but it's also what makes such places ideal for those who want to hide themselves, hide their actions and escape attention. Stephen Barker and Jason Owen had a lot to escape from. At first, they were hiding from social services and their histories of crime, family violence, arson and addiction. But by the time they left Tottenham in August 2007, they were running away from the horrific death of 17-month-old baby Peter, the boy who became known as Baby P. Among the injuries the child suffered at the hands of his carers were a broken back, gashes to the head, a fractured shin bone, a ripped ear, blackened fingers and toes with a missing fingernail, skin torn from the nose and mouth, cuts on the neck and the tooth knocked out. And when I mean a ripped ear, it was literally ripped. A 17 month old baby but the question is, the ripped ear, was it a human who did it or the dog pushed by the human? Because that happened as well. When the humans in the house wanted to have more fun, they would incite the dogs to bite baby pee. Yes, because that's so much fun, right? Their house and baby Peter's home was filled with hardcore pornography internet chat sites, vodka bottles, attack dogs, animal feces, fleas, lice, Nazi paraphernalia, knives and even replica guns. What made this case stand out was the failings of the local authority Herringy, which had also been judged to have been negligent in its protection of Victoria Climey seven years earlier. And you guys, I read the case of Victoria and it's just completely horrifying. I will cover her case in one of my future videos, so keep an eye out for it. Peter had been admitted to hospital with injuries on several occasions and had been seen as many as 60 times, six zero times, by various professionals in the months before he was killed. Only two days before he died, Peter was examined by Sabah al Zayat, a locum consultant pediatrician who didn't notice the boy's broken back and paralysis. Because remember that the pediatrician said that baby Peter was too grumpy to be examined properly? Yeah, a baby with a broken back is grumpy, right? Tracy Connolly's mother, Mary O'Connor, also known as Nula, lives in a small council flat in Islington, North London, with an Alsatian that once belonged to her daughter. Born in Ireland, she was four days old when her own mother died. Her father remarried and her stepmother died when she was five. She never connected with her father and she remembered him as frightening and because of the fear, she would regularly wet the bed. She says that her father, who was raised in an orphanage, was an army man who beat her regularly, and when she was nine, she was actually molested by a relative. She then ran away from home at 13, and after a fight in which she stabbed the girl with a pair of scissors, she was placed in a convent home. She moved to England in her early 20s, and then married a forklift truck driver. She soon left him and met her second husband, Gary Cox, a football pool salesman in Leicester. This marriage wasn't a happy one. Gary Cox, according to her, was a sadist. He used to beat her up for nothing and she couldn't go out without his permission. If she went shopping, he would time her. But she believed that this was normal. 
In the end, she took a knife to her husband, stuck it in his stomach in self-defense, but she couldn't really prove it and she got two years probation for that. I don't think that he died because she left, she, because she left him later on, so yeah, he didn't die. Mary was pregnant 11 times, but only gave birth successfully twice. The first was a boy. Then four years later, she had Tracy. The second child, Tracy, was from a different father. He told police that he had 16 children and said that he fathered Tracy in a one-night drunken fling that took place while Gary Cox, Mary's husband, was present in the house. However, Mary disputes this account. Mary says that she wasn't sure which man was Tracy's father, but Gary, her husband, took against the baby, calling her a bastard. When Tracy was 18 months old, Mary left her husband and son and took Tracy with her to London. According to Tracy, she didn't find out who her real father was until she was 12 years old. It was later revealed that Tracy's real father was convicted of a SA on a child in the 70s. Gary Cox died five years later in his son's arms, Tracy's brother. He then went on to live with Mary and Tracy, but it was quite difficult because he tried to strangle his mom when he was 11 years old. So she put him in care because according to her, he made her life hell and social services were on her back. So she took him down to social services. But the boy had no idea. He thought that they were just going to get a new pair of trainers and then she just turned around and said, see you. She then told the woman from social services, when you're fed up with him, you can bring him back. Around one year later, social services brought the boy back to her, but Mary wouldn't take her own son in unless social services bought a cooker. Yes, a cooker. And so they did. And then Mary got her son back. Mary's son is now with a wife and family and apparently he has a settled life. Tracy Connolly was bullied as a child and Mary, her mom, said. But a lot of the bullying, to be quite honest with you, was her fault. She made herself the victim. I don't know why. She was a strong girl. In the end, social services placed Tracy in funny clothes a boarding school in West Sussex that caters for children with social and emotional difficulties. She did reasonably well at school where she was recalled as moody and promiscuous. At around this time, a close relative of Tracy Connolly was placed in care by Islington Council. According to some reports, this relative became involved in the alleged rings that operated in the authorities care system in the 90s as a victim procurer and a one of the reporters who exposed the rings attributed the problem to five percent corruption 95 percent political correctness this was a damaging embarrassment for the labor-run council in the short term but according to the reporter there was a more disturbing legacy baby p is the evil fruit of that behavior so they are basically saying that baby peter's fate is because of the family's historical abuse going back generations which no i disagree it doesn't work that way after leaving school and aged 16 tracy connolly met peter's father a railway worker then aged 33 who cannot be named for legal reasons a year passed before they moved into a council house in tottenham where tracy gave birth to three daughters in quick succession before baby peter arrived they married six years later in september 2003 Peter's father had no dealings with social services before becoming involved with Tracy. Peter was just three months old when Tracy split from her husband because of arguments over the housework or rather the lack of housework and allegations that she was flirting with other men on internet chat rooms. She was also diagnosed with depression. Within three months, 33-year-old Stephen Barker, who, who Tracy met when he was doing maintenance work on a friend's flat, was her boyfriend. 
by all accounts, Peter's biological father is a loving father and was manipulated by Tracy Connolly along with the authorities. Peter's father repeatedly raised concerns about Peter's welfare after separating with Tracy and particularly after her involvement with Stephen Barker. Tracy Connolly did have children, five of them, and she was pregnant with Stephen's child when she was arrested. According to Tracy's mom, Tracy's husband, baby Peter's father, was a good provider and Tracy had everything within reason. He did three shifts and he cooked, cleaned and even washed her clothes. He even gave her a lovely home, even though she got it through the council. And he wasn't violent or anything like that. For a while, they also took in a young girl who was having problems at home. She helped around the house and the girl referred to Tracy and her husband as mom and dad. The girl, now a young woman, has since become the partner of Tracy Connolly's husband. I mean, oh my god, that, that's some twist there. Okay, anyway. The marriage broke up when Tracy met Stephen Barker and he began hanging around the family home near Green Lanes in North London. The final straw came when Tracy Connolly took Stephen Barker instead of her own husband to a school reunion party. He then moved out and very soon Stephen moved in. At first Stephen appeared to have a close relationship with baby Peter, taking him out to the park and even playing with him. But after a while, according to Tracy's mom, she noticed that her grandson became terrified of him, screaming and crawling away when he entered the room. Mary started questioning Tracy, who told her that baby Peter was just scared of Stephen's height. Witness reports in court spoke about Stephen training baby Peter like a dog. Born in June 1976, the second eldest of five siblings and brought up in London, Stephen Barker went to a special school in Tottenham and had an IQ of about 60. Despite claiming to be unable to read or write during the trial, police were able to prove otherwise through text messages that he had sent. Stephen was obsessed with knives, martial arts, weapons and kept a crossbow as well as a collection of swastika memorabilia. He used to walk around his home in combat gear. As a child, he enjoyed hurting animals and he tortured guinea pigs and frogs, skinning the frogs before breaking their legs. He kept two pet snakes at Tracy Connolly's home and fed them dead chicks, mice and rabbits. His fascination with causing pains to animals saw him prosecuted for that very obsession by the RSPCA. He and his brother, Jason Owen Barker, had previously escaped trial for torturing their own grandmother, Hilda Barker, in an attempt to get her to change her will because she died of pneumonia before the case came to court. He moved in with Tracy Connolly in February 2007, their first home in Hermitage Row, Tottenham. The home was described by social workers as cramped, untidy and smelling of urine. They were moved to a church housing association property in nearby Penshurst Road, which they shared with the family Rottweiler, German Shepherd and Staffordshire Bull Terrier. This is the very same house where Peter, where baby P would die a brutal, lonely and agonizing death. Social workers who visited the house claimed they were unaware of Stephen's presence and of the huge role he played in the lives of Tracy's four children, bathing them, preparing their meals and looking after them while Tracy sat on the computer playing on the internet into the early hours and then spending the rest of the day in bed. At some time around June 2007, Stephen Barker's brother, Jason Barker, who later changed his name to Owen in an attempt to avoid recognition, moved into Tracy Connolly's home with his 15-year-old girlfriend because he was on the run and looking for a place to hide and he is for children. Jason is said to dominate his younger brother and the violence against baby Peter escalated during the time Jason was in the home. 
Jason, who is believed to have bragged whilst out on bail, me and a friend told someone but he went far, attempted to flee the country and escape justice before the trial. In December 2006, when he was nine months old, Peter was admitted to hospital with head injuries. Despite her concerns, Mary didn't tell authorities that Stephen was living with her daughter Tracy. After this, Mary and Tracy were arrested for assaulting baby Peter and the boy was placed in the care of a family friend for six weeks. The police told them they were not pursuing the case three days before Peter's death. After Peter was returned to his mother, Tracy got a new house in Tottenham, continuing to, to hide the fact that she was living with Stephen Barker. By this time, Tracy had grown apart from the boy, from baby Peter. Tottenham is in the borough of Herringy, or Herringy. I, I keep confusing this. The local authority at the center of the Victoria Climby case in which an eight-year-old girl was tortured and murdered by her guardians. When details of the news emerged, there was outrage followed by a public inquiry and Lord Laming's report leading to an overhaul of child protection practices in the UK. The council itself came in for severe criticism which had a major impact on the culture and practice of the authorities' child protection unit. First, a large number of staff were quickly employed to cover the shortages that were exposed during the inquiry. Second, after all the negative attention, an institutional defensiveness surrounded the department. Both developments were to have a detrimental effect on the protection provided to baby Peter Connolly. One senior child protection worker at Herringy recalls the atmosphere when she joined the borough shortly after the Victoria Climby case. Quote, morale was extremely low. The quality of staff was very poor. People were depressed. To give you some idea of the mood, the cafe opposite wouldn't serve social workers. End of quote. The recruitment drive didn't help matters either. Quote again. Post climbing, they desperately needed staff. So they went to South Africa and Zimbabwe and recruited people from different cultures. There was then a whole challenge of managing people with different cultural norms and expectations about raising children. They also had motivations other than protecting children to eat working in this country, saving money and sending it home. End of quote. Okay. I'm going to comment on this because I'm a foreigner in the UK, okay? According to this social worker, a lot of time and energy was spent on managing staff and dealing with their problems rather than focusing on the needs of children at risk. And once social workers were employed, the process of removing them from the job was so time consuming that they were left in place. And to be fair to them, says the social worker, they worked hard, but it wasn't the level, the level of expertise and insight required for the complexity of work. So what happens is that you allocate the work to the good workers and they become overloaded. Yes, and I can, I can kind of see here shifting the blame, if I'm honest. So now, it wasn't the fault of the social workers from the UK because, whoa, yeah, they were so very well educated because they were educated in the UK, but it was the fault of the ones brought in from outside of the UK because they had different standards, right? But then, how do you explain the death of Victoria Climby with the standards from the UK? Whose fault was that? Hers? In her case, social workers weren't brought in from South Africa and Zimbabwe and yet she passed away because of the failure of so many institutions who were meant to protect her. It's like saying because you are from another country, you are automatically of a lower standard than if you are from the UK. That's just mind-blowing to me. Honestly, it's mind-blowing because, again, honestly, I have been treated the same way by so many people here in the UK because I am from a different country, they assume I'm stupid and I don't know anything. Because I'm from a different country and my first language is not English and maybe I don't understand a word or two or an accent or two, they just assume 
that I'm an idiot and I don't understand English and I don't speak English and they just assume that it's just frustrating to me but they just assume that because you are from a different country automatically your education doesn't have a high standard your culture doesn't have a high standard your manners doesn't have a high standard and so on and so forth is is as if only if you are born in the UK can you be educated and with manners and with culture <laughs> I guess from my point of view if I'm here to be blatantly honest with everyone the fact that I am in the UK and uh, I am a foreigner in the UK and I speak the language I think it says volumes because apart from my own first language I speak I speak a second language and a third language and the fourth and the fifth language which should just go to show that I have an education right and you don't just assume just because I'm from a different country I'm less of a person or more stupid of a person just because English is my second language and why would you assume that my education system is worse than yours you, you know what I mean I'm, I'm blatantly honest here and I know I'm going to offend a few people and quite honestly I couldn't care less because I have been over these 15 years in the UK offended so many times so many times that I just can't count and then the last point that I want to make is I speak your language do you speak mine you know what I mean and apart from your language I also speak mine but do you speak a second language my question and quite honestly I am dealing now with the legal system and also the local authority and I've been dealing with them since December so it's been more than six months now because I've been starting dealing with them since the 8th of December and we are now at the end of June so Yes, the way that they made me feel and they continue to make me feel is as if because I'm a foreigner, I don't know anything, I'm an idiot, I'm stupid, this is how they make me feel. And only now, after six months, they are asking me about my culture, after six months. So that's just mind-blowing to me and this is only because I raised the issue. If I wouldn't have raised the issues that nobody is asking me about my culture, before judging what I do, now they are asking me about that. So yeah, it just goes to show that now, even though usually I just ignore these kind of things, but now because I'm in the in the middle of a legal process, which obviously I can't talk about, it it uh, kind of offends me even more because I know that this is exactly how I'm being made to feel, exactly like how this social worker said about the social workers being brought from South Africa and Zimbabwe so yeah uh, it's just uh, it's just really a clarification just because you are uh, a foreigner it doesn't mean that you are an idiot and one who is born here is not you know what I mean it doesn't mean that we have less education and it doesn't mean that we know less than people who are born here this is uh, you know this is the point that I'm trying to get across so anyway, let's carry on with Baby P because I don't want to take away from his case here. Tracy Connolly even joined a mellow parenting group because Peter was on the at-risk register. Now, a mellow parenting group, I think this, this de the name depends from council, from local council to local council. It's basically a parenting training course where they teach you things about how to parent. So yeah, she was on that parenting course, parent in the parenting group, because baby Peter at the time was on the at-risk register. Stephen Barker's history is no greater than Tracy's either. His older brother Jason is believed to have bullied and used him as a child, and his sister revealed that as a boy he liked to kill animals, skinning frogs alive and breaking their legs, which I just mentioned. And in my opinion guys this is a clear indication of a killer right there red flags guys red flags a killer or a future killer in 1995 the two young men moved into the Kent home of their grandmother Hilda Barker they terrorized the 82 year old woman by wearing Halloween masks and stopping her from seeing her friends she told police that the brothers locked her in a cupboard until she agreed to leave her money to them 
They were charged with assault, but the charges were dropped after Hilda Barker died of pneumonia. Jason, who has five children from two different women, had convictions for arson and burglary. He was also accused of committing rape as a 13-year-old. He was later investigated for victimizing an Asian family. Remember, he was the one with the Nazis' preferences. Jason moved from South London into the house in Tottenham because he was fleeing the family of his 15 year old girlfriend, one five, 15 year old, an underage girl. He took three of his children with him. He was on the run with the underage partner. I mean, why would he decide to take his children out of school and also drag them along? I have no idea. The house in Tottenham was already overcrowded as it was and they all had to be hidden from the authorities. I mean, imagine an underage girl with Jason and three children. That's a hell of a job to conceal. Like, seriously. According to a police officer in the case, the children were his property. Children, in Jason's mind, were possessions. Something that you had rather than nurtured. And this is sadly the case in so many of these cases and with so many children. There is also a culture of let's have them for the sake of benefits. The more we have, the more benefits we receive. As harsh as it sounds, sadly it's true in a lot of these cases. A lot of things were written about Baby P's case and one such writer suggested that it was a, that it was a crime against societies idealized perception of motherhood almost as if expecting a mother not to talk to her child was utterly unrealistic it's um, it's quite honestly it's really sad in fact heartbreaking that there are outlets out there who side with the abuser and the murderer just for the sake of creating a conversation getting more eyes on the article it's like you it's like you leave your humanity behind for the sake of popularity but the fact remains there is a growing class of state dependents who have gained few if any life skills other than an ability to work the system i am not saying that everyone does it because that's hardly the case however a lot of them do on Friday 27th of July 2007, a week before his death, baby Peter stayed the night with his father. Peter's grandmother, Mary O'Connor, Tracy's mom, also stayed the night. There was only one bedroom which they all shared. According to Mary, she tried to stop baby Peter from crying and waking up his father who was asleep. In the end, she did wake him up. She had to wake him up, according to her, because she was just really worried about the state of baby Peter. His hands were bandaged and there were bruises and cuts on his head. She said, let's take him to the hospital. There is something wrong with him. Whatever happened that night, we don't know the full story. Baby Peter was not taken to hospital. The father later explained that he was reassured by Tracy that medical authorities were aware of the baby's injuries, but they were not considered serious. The following morning, baby Peter was returned to his mother. This would be the last time that his father ever saw baby Peter alive. No one apart from those involved know exactly what happened during the final three days of baby Peter's life. Each of them blamed each other. However, it's very likely that all participants were complicit in a series of violent, ultimately deadly attacks on poor baby Peter. While being interviewed, Stephen and Jason made allegations about each other's involvement in baby Peter's death. Jason claimed that baby Peter's mother, Tracy, and her boyfriend Stephen had, prior to baby P's death, wrapped him up like a cocoon and laid him face down on the floor and left him there all day. Stephen claimed that Jason gathered the bedding from baby P's cot into a black dustbin liner and disposed of it. Detectives admit that the absence of forensic evidence and the lack of reliable evidence from those involved in baby P's last moments meant that they would always have struggled to convict anyone of murder. 
After deliberation, the Old Bailey judge directed the jury to acquit, to acquit the three defendants of murder. They were found guilty of an alternative charge of causing or allowing baby Peter's death. In a bitter irony, this was one of the few decisive acts by anyone in authority dealing with the 17 chaotic months of baby P's life. 15 years ago, 17-month-old Peter Connolly was found dead in his cot after months of cruelty from those who were meant to care for him the most. His mother Tracy, her boyfriend Stephen Barker and his brother Jason Owen were convicted of causing or allowing his death. Peter's short life was filled with pain. He suffered more than 50 injuries, 5-0. The resulting investigations revealed that over an eight-month period he was seen 60 times by social workers from Herringy Council, doctors and police. These were, these were the 60 opportunities to save his life. These were 60 opportunities to not turn a blind eye and simply do more. These were 60 failed opportunities from people who probably were parents themselves and at the end of their 9 to 5 job they got to go home and hug their kids. No one, no one gave baby Peter this opportunity. death happened only a few years after the high-profile death of Victoria Climie, also involving Herringy, it didn't take long for the media to focus on the failings of social services in the area. A serious case review published in 2010 found Peter's death should and could have been prevented. Really, <laughs> we didn't know that. Yes? Yes, his death should have been prevented 60 times and his death could have been prevented 60 times. Think about the opportunities, 60 opportunities, 60 opportunities. Every agency involved in baby Peter's care, including health, the police and social services had been well motivated and wanted to protect him, but their practice collectively and individually was completely inadequate and failed to properly challenge Tracy's explanations for maltreatment suffered by her son. Although the serious case review made clear that mistakes had been made across all services, the political and media commotion that followed focused almost entirely on the social workers and their boss, Sharon Shoesmith. This was partly because David Cameron, then leader of the opposition, painted Peter's death as a Labour government failing on child protection, and partly because the Sun newspaper, under the e editorship of Rebecca Brooks, yes, Rebecca Brooks, decided to launch a baby P campaign, labeling it as a fight for justice and calling for the sackings of all those involved at Herringy. So, uh, to put it plain and simple, they use Baby P's death as an opportunity to advance their political campaigns. Yes. The most vicious attacks named and shamed the social workers who were eventually sacked. Ed Balls, then Education Secretary, ordered the removal of Sharon Shoesmith live on TV. Sharon was the boss of social workers involved. Sharon said, quote, he at Balls had no idea of the damage he was about to inflict on the social work profession and on children because of that baby P effect. A lot of those, a lot of those children are still in care now. That has really troubled me for a decade, she says. Yes, I'm sure it did. She also said he thought this was just one rogue director and the crap department, that Herringy was a basket case that needed to be sorted out in isolation. He didn't know the size of what he was unleashing. It wasn't only social workers who lost their nerve, 
it was everyone in the child protection system end of quote and Sharon darling I really can't sympathize with you I just cannot sympathize with you this is just pointing the fingers somewhere else how about taking responsibility for the 60 failed opportunities how about that Sharon how about that because you are now probably in, in your pension age but baby P never got the opportunity to reach a pension age did he no he didn't so who do we blame the obvious institutions and people and everybody around baby P who clearly failed him Herringy Council initiated an internal audit, serious case review, also known as SCR, after Peter's death. After completion of the court case, only an executive summary was released to the public. The full report was kept confidential with only some employees of Herringy Council and Herringy Councillors allowed access. The two local MPs whose constituencies covered Herringy, Lynn Featherstone and David Lammy, Robert Gorey and the spokesperson for children's services were asked to sign non-disclosure agreements to view the document. Ed Balls condemned the serious case review and called for a second report with an independent adjudicator. The Mail on Sunday on 15th of March 2009 reported that details of the SCR had come into its possession. The article claimed that the executive summary of the SCR either conflicted with or omitted details about how the case had been handled and the extent of the injuries suffered by Peter. Furthermore, there were instances of mishandling by officials, missed and delayed meetings, miscommunication amongst, among officials and a failure to follow through with decisions related to the child's safety. It also noted, among other issues, that officials had not followed through with obtaining an interim care order that would have removed Peter from his home when they had agreed that legal grounds existing, existed for doing so six months before he died. Key officials also failed to attend a 25th of July 2007 meeting intended to decide if it would be necessary to remove Peter from his mother's home at that time. So Sharon, my question again, who is to blame? Who do we point the finger at? Who failed Peter? Who failed baby P? I guess that the answer by now is quite obvious. Lynn Featherstone MP was critical of Herringy Council writing, quote, I personally met with George Meehan and Ita O'Donovan, Herringy Council's leader and chief executive, to raise with them three different cases where the pattern was in each case Herringy seeming to want to blame anyone who complained rather than to look at the complaint seriously. I was promised action but despite repeated subsequent requests for news on progress I was just stonewalled." End of quote. Three council workers including one senior lawyer were given written warnings about their actions. The General Medical Council GMC separately examined the roles of two doctors, Dr. Jerome Ikeuk, a GP, and Dr. Sabah Arzayat, a pediatrician who examined baby Peter two days before his death. Although Dr. Jerome had twice referred Peter to hospital specialists, the GMC's interim orders panel suspended him for 18 months. Al Zayat, who has been accused of failing to spot baby P's injuries, was suspended pending an inquiry. Her contract with Great Ormond Street Hospital, responsible for child services in Harrogate, was also terminated. She was the one who said that baby P was just grumpy when he actually had a broken back. Ed Balls, Secretary of State for Children, Schools and Families, ordered an external inquiry into Harringy Council Social Services. The inquiry was not to examine the, pa the baby P case explicitly, but to look into whether Harringy Social Services were following correct procedures in general. This report was presented to ministers on 1st of December 2008. During a press conference that day, the minister announced that in an unusual move, he had used special powers to remove Sharon Shoesmith from her post as head of children's services at Herringy Council. 
She rejected calls for her resignations, saying that she wanted to continue to support her staff during the investigations, but was dismissed on 8th of December 2008 by Herringy Council without any compensation package. Yes, so I guess that she was feeling quite uh, bitter around it. Sharon, Mrs. Mrs. whatever Sharon, in my opinion, allegedly. Now, if you think that this is the end of the story, <laughs> No, it's not. Brace yourselves, because Sharon, dear Sharon Shoesmith, later brought legal action against Ed Balls, Ofsted and Herringy Council, claiming that the decision with, which led to her dismissal were unfair. <laughs> I mean, guys, this is just unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. It just goes to show that at the end of the day, when it comes to the local authority, when it comes to uh, social services, when it comes to, you know, all these uh, public institutions, they simply do not care about the person. For them, and I'm saying it and I'm going to say it again and I, and I have been saying it and I'm going to carry on saying it, for them, you are just a number on a piece of paper, for them, you are just a part of their nine to five job. And when they finish that job at the end of the day, psh, that's it. They couldn't care less because for them is a nine to five job. They don't see children as children. In my opinion, in my opinion, allegedly they see children as a job from nine to five. After five o'clock, we disconnect and that's it. Bye bye. All finished. I'm not saying that all social workers are the same because obviously they are not. And we already know that. All I'm saying is that a lot of not only social workers, but uh, people who work for local authority and also for these public institutions, they, they fail to think about the person behind their 9 to 5 job, about that baby behind their 9 to 5 job, about uh, the family behind their 9 to 5 job. You know what I mean? It's like they, they fail to see, to touch their own humanity with, with these kind of things. I don't even know how to explain it, but I think that, you know, I made my point across here. The High Court dismissed this claim in April 2010, although Sharon Shoesmith was still entitled to pursue an action for unfair dismissal in an employment tribunal. In May 2011, yes, Sharon Shoesmith's appeal against her dismissal succeeded in the Court of Appeal. The Department of Education and Herringy Council said they intended to appeal to the Supreme Court against this decision. Their applications for leave to appeal to the Supreme Court were refused on 1st of August 2011. Okay, guys, again, I'm saying it again, another shocker. Brace yourselves again, because it was reported by BBC News on 29th of October 2013 that Sharon Shoesmith agreed to a six-figure payout for unfair dismissal. She received, allegedly, 679,452,000 £600 pounds, pounds, more than half a million pounds. And this is just unbelievable. Oh my God. I mean, she failed and they all failed to protect baby Peter and she gets rewarded for this. It's just insane. It's insane, honestly. Also announced on 1st of December 2008 were the resignations of Labour Council leader George Meehan and councillor Liz Sentry, cabinet member for children and young people. These councillors had previously refused calls for their resignation during a 24th of November council meeting. In April 2009, the council announced that its deputy director of children's services, two other managers and a social worker who had been suspended pending an inquiry had also all been dismissed. Three further inquiries were also ordered. The role of all agencies involved in Peter Connolly's case, including the Health Authority, Police and Herringy Council would be reviewed. The General Social Care Council would look into potential breaches of its code of practice. 
Lord Lemming would conduct a nationwide review of his own recommendations after the Victoria Climby inquiry. Through a lawyer acting on her behalf, a former social worker from Herringy, Nevris Kemal, sent a letter to the Secretary of the Department of Health, Patricia Hewitt, in February 2007, six months before Peter's death. The letter contained an allegation that child protection procedures were not being followed in Herringy. Patricia Hewitt took no action except to forward the letter to the DES, now the Department for Children, Schools and Families. Herringy Council then took out an injunction against Nervris Kemal, who was actually trying to speak out for children, banning her from speaking about childcare in Herringy. Her lawyer stated, quote, Hewitt bounced us onto the DES. The DES then advised us to write to the Commission for Social Care Inspection whom we had written to on the same day as we had written to Hewitt, copying in the letter to Hewitt and the relevant material. By that time, of course, they had an injunction, injunction against us, so we couldn't go back to the inspectorate. The inspectorate had been properly advised at the time and had done nothing, end of quote. So you see that you also have good social workers and good workers who are trying to do the right thing and then they are being silenced. That's why when I say what I said, I said not all of the social workers and staff working for the local authority are the same. Hey guys, editing cat here. Whilst I was editing this video, I came across an article from the Daily Mail, which I think is very important to mention. This article is about the social worker was the whistleblower, Navris Kemal, and uh, I am going to read a couple of pieces from this article. In an exclusive interview with the Mail on Sunday, social worker Navris Kemal said Herringy's monstrous allegation, which was made, she says, in response to the concerns she raised, left her terrified that she would lose her daughter. Miss Kemal had been accused falsely of shaking her fist in the face of a 14-year-old girl, which was not her daughter, which, according to Herringy, constituted child abuse. She says, they, they then turned their attention to my own daughter and launched a child protection investigation into her, which means that they felt she was at risk. Ultimately, it could have led to her being taken away from me. I felt terribly frightened all the time. It was evil. She also revealed how council staff were taken on team building junkets to Barcelona and Dublin and spent £1,000 on a tea party at the Ritz while back at work. Cases of potentially children were piling up. During what she calls a four-year witch hunt, Miss Kemal, 44 years old at the time, lost her job, faced a police investigation, and saw her family and health fall apart. An employment tribunal heard that she had been singled out by her bosses because she was a whistleblower. Herringy eventually dropped the case and paid her undisclosed compensation. An experienced child protection officer, Miss Kemal, had joined the London Borough in 2004, hoping it had learned lessons from the appalling episodes in its recent past, including the case of Victoria Climby, the eight-year-old murdered in 2000. Miss Kemal was like a breath of fresh air, said a colleague, someone who liked to roll her sleeves up and set to work, rather than take part in meetings about meetings. Yet, very quickly, it became apparent to Ms. Kemal that the new management brought in to prevent a repeat of the murder of Victoria Climby was still failing to protect children in its care. Unlike others, Ms. Kemal did not remain silent. She warned that there was a very real risk of another murder. Faced with her concerns, her managers took swift action but not, it seems, to avert another tragedy. While they were busy trying to smear her, says Miss Kemal, baby P was being used as a punch bag and entering the final stage of his tragically short life. Miss Kemal offers a damning behind-the-scenes insight 
into Herring's inept social services department. Quote, God save us from endless inquiries, she says. What Herring needs is managers sacked and arrested, common sense to prevail and money put into frontline services. Children's Services Director Sharon Schusmith and Deputy Director Cecilia Hitchen have now agreed in writing that Ms. Kemal never abused a child in or outside work. Quote, I never regretted speaking up for the children who needed protection, says Ms. Kemal. I never thought, even when I was at my most scared, why did I not keep my mouth shut? Even my elderly mother knew it was quite clear I'd open my mouth to defend children who Herringy wasn't defending and they almost immediately accused me of child abuse. Nevris Kemal began work at the council in late August 2004. Ms. Kemal's immigrant parents arrived here in 1958 with just seven pounds fifty between them and their little girl learned early to take responsibility as their interpreter in a foreign world. She is a typically dutiful Turkish daughter. After her father died, she moved back into her childhood home to keep her mother company. She is also a westernized, politically aware and independent woman. She says, quote, the office was very cliquey. Two key senior women were in a relationship and if your face didn't fit, that was it. You'd just be handed files with no discussion. If you asked questions, you were stupid. Herring is abys abysmal reputation had hindered the recruitment of experienced, high quality staff. On October 15, 2004, Ms. Kemal's manager allocated her a file about a group of children. Teachers and relatives feared that the same male carer had subjected these children to grave and had alerted social services many months before. But the social worker responsible had quit. The file had not been reallocated and the children were simply forgotten. Ms. Kemal was horrified and told an employment tribunal, quote, children had not been properly protected. It was exactly the sort of situation after the mistakes of the Victoria Climate tragedy in Herringy that the new management brought in to improve procedures and standards in child protection was supposed to prevent. End of quote. Ms. Kemal hurriedly interviewed the little group of children, the youngest was only three, and decided that they urgently needed rescuing. Medical evidence could be vital if they were to be taken into care or the men prosecuted, and they could need urgent treatment. But incredibly, no one seemed clear who was responsible for authorizing medicals, whether it was social services police or health officials. Post climbing, Ms. Kemal found this extraordinary. Medicals are basic to child protection work. She fired off desperate emails and finally went over her manager's head to alert the department's chief. She made it clear that the children had already waited months, a delay which could be traced back to social services but she received no reply. She therefore blew the whistle by alerting a local nurse consultant on child protection, Dorian Cole. He finally cut through the lethargy. He raised the case at the Area Child Protection Committee and even circulated a flowchart on who had which responsibilities. Okay, folks, he wrote, this is getting stupid. This is not complicated. Let's get it sorted. On November 15, Ms. Kemal managed to get the children added to the Child Protection Register and they were eventually taken into care. But, she says, after this whistleblowing, management became hostile towards me. She adds, quote, I was destructively and comprehensively investigated and punished for doing nothing wrong, whereas the managers who investigated me left children with an abuse for months. It was climbing all over again, except that thankfully on this occasion no child died. Herringy used the allegations of a violent, mentally ill man as the basis of their case against Miss Kemal. Her own family had been friends with the man's family, fellow Turks, for 50 years and her mother spoke by phone every day to his wife. 
but the man had become a gambler, paranoid and violent, and was, for a time, compulsorily sectioned to a mental hospital. Six years ago, the frightened wife found the courage to leave him, and Miss Kemal helped her and her then 12-year-old daughter find a new home. The, mu the Muslim husband furiously blamed Miss Kemal, a Christian, and her feminist Western ways. In November 2004, the woman rang Miss Kemal's mother. The woman's daughter, who was now 14, had begun staying out late and she feared mixing with boys who used drugs. But like many modern teenagers, the girl became angry when her mother pointed out the dangers. She asked if Miss Kemal could come over to talk to the girl about keeping herself safe. The mother had already asked having his social services for advice, but in vain. Miss Kemal did not hesitate to help, but she found mayhem at the house. Everyone was shouting and the girl told her to F off. Two days later, the woman's ex-husband falsely complained to the council that Miss Kemal had shaken her fist in his daughter's face. The council that did nothing while little Victoria Climey was tortured to death there were too many injuries on her emaciated body for the pathologist to count, launched a full-scale investigation accusing Ms. Kemal of child abuse. Ms. Kemal was first questioned on November 17 by her manager. Only independent external investigators are meant to question staff accused of abuse. She freely admitted that she had briefly raised her voice to be heard above the clamor and when the girl swore, raised her hand in a stop gesture. Miss Kemal had provided the council the stick it wanted in order to beat her. Extra extraordinarily, it decided that the raised hand and voice constituted child abuse, common assault. Now it set about gathering further evidence. A manager knew about the father's mental illness and alleged domestic but interviewed the girl in her but interviewed the girl in her father's presence the unhappy confused teenager confirmed her father's allegations experts observed that she was likely to have come under great pressure from her father and indeed she later retracted her accusation and offered to give evidence for miss kemal no matter on the next day december the 1st a divisional manager suspended her Miss Kemal returned to the family home in North London, cowed, mystified and terrified. The manager had announced a full-scale Section 47 child investigation, which would mean that Herringy would later turn their attention to Miss Kemal's daughter, who was then 13 years old. Quote, I reacted like normal families react, with anger and disbelief, says Miss Kemal. What was so terribly wrong is that the system that had the power and the duty to protect children was now hounding me for trying to protect children. It was like I was in a fascist country. I felt totally alone. After Christmas, I learned that they would be investigating my daughter. My daughter is my world. I adore her. It was such an injustice, a farce. By launching this type of investigation, and to this day, I don't know exactly what they did or who they spoke to, it means that the child is at risk. It's an understatement to say I cried. I cried a river. Even now, I cry thinking about it. How dare they cover their own failures by accusing me of abuse? It has made me a more sensitive social worker, I hope. I now know how ordinary families feel if wrongly accused. I was so frightened of losing her that I would hold her like when she was a baby and just cling to her. Just looking at how beautiful she was and is and think how in the world can these human beings these professionals, my former colleagues, accuse me of hurting my own child. Christmas at the Kemal house was tense and the social worker's devout mother prayed hard, often in tears. The family's mortification was complete when on January 11, 2005, two police officers turned up unannounced at their home. They cautioned Miss Kemal for an alleged common assault on a child and told her 
to accompany them to the police station, but she refused to be questioned there like a criminal. She had worked with one officer on several cases and they agreed to question her at home. She concluded that the police were trying to help her get Herringy off her back. Once the tape was off, they hinted she had already been exonerated. Sure enough, three days later, police told social services there were no grounds for prosecution. Yet, Herringy's investigation continued. More safety checks were now ordered on her own child. The family doctor and school denied there was any concerns but Miss Kemal's stomach knotted with nerves when she stood at the school gates. She was terrified other parents would discover she was under investigation for child abuse. Unable to ask children back to play with her child and the whole family became isolated. In March, Herring's investigator submitted her conclusions. She felt the 14-year-old girl was under pressure from her mother to retract the allegation against Miss Kemal. She believed the original allegation and that the girl's father was protective and supportive. Miss Kemal was now told she faced the sack. Her union, Unison, criticized management for still failing to specify the charge. This is, uh, the article is not uh, over yet, but um, I think I'm just going to drag this much longer if I carry on reading the article. But anyway, it just goes to show that when a social worker is trying to tell the truth about how children are being treated in the social services system, then, then social services will do everything in their power to shut these individuals up who are trying to speak. Like you see with uh, Miss Kemal, they threatened to take her daughter and they even accused her of child abuse. Even though the police investigation clearly said that there is absolutely no indication of that, they still went forward. So, yeah. Kim Holt, a consultant pediatrician who worked in a clinic run by Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital at St. Anne's Hospital in Herring in North London, said that she and three colleagues wrote an open letter detailing problems at the clinic in 2006. She claimed baby Peter could have been saved if managers had listened to fears raised by senior doctors. Lord Lemming, Lord Lemming published his report, The Protection of Children in England, a progress report on 12th of March 2009. He stated that too many authorities had failed to adopt reforms introduced following his previous review into welfare following the murder of Victoria Climey in 2000. On 5th of March 2012, Peter's biological father was awarded £75,000 in damages after the people wrongly stated in its 19th of September 2010 edition that he was a convicted SEX offender. Lawyers for the man, known only as KC, said that the publishers of the people were guilty of one of the grave of one of the gravest libels imaginable. Publishers MGN had previously apologized and offered to pay damages. In September 2015, in a survey of 751 health visitors polled by the community practitioners and health visitors association, 47% thought it was somewhat likely or very likely that a similar death would recur. The baby P effect was felt across the board. Sarah, a children's social worker, was working in a child protection team in England when the baby P case hit its peak. She remembers referrals flooding in as other agencies classed more cases as child protection terrified of missing another baby P. She says it made it harder for social workers to spot those needing urgent action. They became needles in the haystack. Quote, health, education, you name it, were piling it all into us. The police were very risk averse too. So we were going out on joint visits all over the place for things that should not have needed the police and the child protection social worker turning up at your door. End of quote. Again, I'm saying, and I'm going to say it, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself like a broken record here. I don't see anything wrong with this. In my honest opinion, any tip, any doubt, 
Any report needs to be followed by all agencies needed to ensure that children are safe. So, yes, social workers became defensive in their practice, focused on following procedures rather than what would most make a difference to children. Too many assessments were carried out to no real purpose other than ensuring services would be covered if something, anything went wrong, Sarah recalls. Yes, and I think this is the, the same, it's echoing in today's uh, social services as well, their assessments and all of this, I'm not getting into it. Quote, senior managers didn't want to be the next Sharon Shoesmith. Middle managers were terrified that the buck would stop with them if bad decisions were made. And the frontline staff felt like they were carrying everyone's risk and anxiety. End of quote. Social workers also had to work doubly hard when working with families where child protection concerns existed, she says, with some parents quick to point to the baby P coverage if questioned about their own children. Now, I'm going to say here that doubly hard, what is that supposed to mean? I mean, when you're a social worker and when you're any kind of worker for that matter, aren't you supposed to work hard anyway? So what does doubly hard means? To me, this statement just doesn't make sense. So going back to what Sarah, the social worker said, people will say, what would you know? You let the little boy die. There's often a degree of mistrust of social workers anyway. It's very rare in child protection that somebody wants you there. And it's often only years later that anyone realizes what you did and why you did it, she says. Yes, no comment. Yeah, I guess, I think we know how this goes. It's difficult for families and you know that, but because the press coverage was so big, it felt like there was suddenly another huge barrier to get through before you could have conversations with people about their own children. Now, <clears throat> let's face it guys, no matter what a social worker would say, the system is broken. The system is not was not and it will not help so many children who needed help who still do and who will in the future you know i tend to believe that nothing will ever change yes we say that we learn from our mistakes then it happens again then another review is done then some more issues are found then another child dies we are just going around in circles and at the end of it nothing ultimately changes. Jilly Chris too, a team manager in the Herringy Child Protection Service that had overseen Peter's case, was at the center of the storm. She says hearing that a child you've been working with has died is among the worst news any social worker can get and she will never forget the day she was told about baby Peter. Quote, I still remember the shock I felt. How had this happened? Why this child of all the others I had responsibility for? It was unexpected. Initially, there was confusion about how Peter had died. It may, it may be hard to believe, but at that time, there was no talk of serious injury and the question of how still needed to be answered. I had no idea how to react. End of quote. Christou had worked in social work for 25 years, much of it in children's services, but she'd never experienced anything like this. While investigations into Peter's death were underway, she continued to work with the families she had responsibility for, but the stress of trying to carry on in the job while processing the sadness of Peter's death was phenomenal, she says. It was during the criminal trial where she was appearing as a witness that she first saw the utterly terrifying level of media interest in the story. On the 11th of November 2008, with the convictions for Peter's death served, it was announced the serious case review would be published and the press stepped up its interest in the social workers. The first day a journalist knocked on her front door was the last that she ever practiced in a profession that she says she loved and still misses to this day. Quote, that was the last day I did any work as a social worker. The media and politicians had stepped in and made it 
unsafe for me to return to work, Gilly says. I also felt unsafe at home as reporters and photographers found their way to my door. The realization over the next few days of what seemed to be unfolding was the next shock to my system. End of quote. Stress and shock. How about the stress and shock of baby P? How was baby Peter feeling when he was tortured to death? And maybe with every single one of those 60 opportunities, he hoped it will be better. But it only got worse. And in the end, he couldn't hope any longer. Because his hope was taken away from him. And you talk about shock and stress. In my opinion, that's just completely disgusting, to say the least, to use the nicer word, in my opinion, allegedly. Days of national headlines became weeks, and then weeks became months. By this time, the Sun launched its Baby P campaign, including a petition demanding the sackings of Gilly Christou and her colleagues. It got 1.4 million signatures. Gilly Christou remembers going to a shop and seeing an invite to sign it on the counter. Quote, it was horrible, I just had to leave, she says. At that point, the coverage was so big. It was all out there, I just couldn't do anything. I felt numb and defeated. And of course, at points, the distress, the frustration, the shame and the vulnerability felt overwhelming, says Gilly. You either let it completely finish you off or you have to go on. I still had other roles in life I needed to fulfill. I had to find the strength to keep going, end of quote. I don't even know why I'm why I'm including this in the video, but I, I know why I'm including this in the video because I just want to show you what the social workers directly involved with uh, baby Peter's case, what they are saying and what they are talking about and how they are feeling and how they are still, from my perspective, disregarding the plain and simple fact that they failed to protect baby P. In other words, they fail even now to take responsibility that it was their fault. Not only their fault, all of the agency's fault. Social services, the local authority, the police, the health system, the hospital, the doctors, just about everyone. Apart from, of course, those who actually tried to come forward and they were being silenced legally. Yes, uh, and again, I'm saying something which baby Peter could never do. He could never find the strength to keep going because he was never allowed that chance to find the strength to keep going. He could never do that. And the truth is, guys, that if the media wouldn't have done as much coverage as they did, quite a lot of us would have no idea what happened. A lot of us would have no clue of all the failures of the various agencies involved. And I, I suppose that the agencies, this is what they are looking for. They are looking to keep everything hidden from the public because, oh my God, God forbid an uproar by the public, right? In August 2009, hearing his disciplinary process finished. Gilly Christo was told she would be sacked along with the other social care staff involved in the case. Nine months later, she was told that the social work regulator, the GSCC, would report its findings of a lengthy investigation into the fitness to practice of Gilly Christou and Maria Ward, who had been Peter's allocated social worker. The investigation found both social workers' mistakes in the case amounted to misconduct. They failed to keep adequate records. Maria Ward had failed to visit Peter often enough. Gilly Christou, as Maria Ward's manager, failed to provide enough supervision to her social worker. However, Gilly Christou and Maria Ward were not barred from being social workers. The GSCC issued the pair with suspensions after concluding that, they were error, that their errors were not serious enough for them to be struck off. The committee handling the investigation said the striking of order would have been disproportionate and serve no purpose other than satisfying a perceived public demand for blame and punishment. And blame and punishment should be. But it turns out that not everybody agrees.
Julie Christou says the GSCC's decision remains hugely important to her, give, to her given some of the tabloid narrative that had developed around her and Maria Ward. Quote, they could see that we hadn't deliberately or maliciously set out to ignore this child and his family. They didn't see enough to think that we shouldn't be social workers. And yet, the media had been saying these people shouldn't be allowed near children, that we were a danger to the public, end of quote. Initially, Julie Christou harbored hopes of returning to social work, but eventually she concluded that the brutal hit her confidence had taken would make it impossible for her to do the job well. Well, well, that's at least one point I agree with. Luckily, she, she didn't practice the job anymore. She and Maria Ward launched an unsuccessful legal challenge to their sackings, arguing Herringy had dismissed them unfairly. By the time that case finished, Jilly Christou had shelved any hopes of rejoining the profession. And probably you shouldn't, in my opinion. In the meantime, politicians commissioned a series of reviews of the social work profession following a second Lemming report. In 2009, the then Labour government published the findings of the Social Work Task Force, which led to the creation of the Social Work Reform Board and the College of Social Work in a bid to boost the profession status. By the time the media quest to find a new angle to the story meant more attention was being paid to the issues around high caseloads, inadequate IT systems and problems with recruitment and retention of social workers. When the Conservative and Liberal Democrat coalition government came to power in 2010, it wanted and needed its own plan for social work reform particularly in children's services. He commissioned Professor Eileen Munro, a former social worker and highly respected academic at the London School of Economics, to carry out a root and branch review of child protection. Munro found social services had become so obsessed with complying with procedures and regulations that professional skill and a basic focus on relationships had been eroded in social work. Quote, the broader public sector was gripped by new public management at the time and the idea that top, the, that top down control was the way to do it. It was called the targets and terror approach. When you apply that to the child protection field, which has enough terror anyway because of the horror of a child dying, then it really was quite damaging, she says. Yeah, like I said, number on a piece of paper and following whatever. I was really quite disturbed by how many social workers talked about families they were working with in a very bureaucratic rather than a human way. Somebody was a section 47 rather than a woman who is living with four children in an appalling house who is trying her hardest but making a bit of a mess of it. If you don't make the human contact with a person then you can't help solve their problems. At least, to me, that's what social work is about. But social work had become about processing and referring on, not helping." End of quote. Munro set out a blueprint for a child-centered system that she felt would help create the conditions to help professionals make the best judgments they could to protect a child. Her review recommended cutting down the government di dictated and prescriptive guidance and replacing it with greater trust in professionals' judgment. It called on council leaders to, to take more responsibility for giving social workers the right conditions to practice effectively and Ofsted to focus inspections on social work practice, not just paperwork. Munro also recommended the creation of two new roles. The first was a principal child and family social worker in every council who would be involved in some direct work as well as management. The second was a national chief social worker who would give the profession greater visibility in government. Six years on from her report, many of Munro's recommendations had been, have been acted on. She feels children's services are overall going in the right direction with about a third of councils making fantastic progress in creating the right kind of social work culture.
However, she is concerned that too little is being done to tackle the high caseloads and working conditions such as hot desking that she feels can rob social workers of the tools and time to do the job well. Quote, being clear about what conditions we need and workload management is a crucial problem because the one thing that any good social work requires is time. The authorities that have been rated outstanding by Ofsted have got tiny caseloads. It's not a total explanation, but it's one factor. And how well did that work? Because we now also have Star Hobson. Arthur Labinio Hughes and so many others. There so clearly is not working, but some argue that none of the institutions involved, the press, the politicians or the social work profession have been tested to the same extremes they were back in in 2007 and 2008. Ray Jones, a social work professor who has authored an extensive account of the Baby P case, says the reaction to Peter's death was exceptional in three ways. The intensity of the Sun's coverage, Cameron's decision to politicize it from day one of the story breaking, and the degree of harassment and hatred directed at Shoesmith and the social workers. Quote, but we have still seen cases since where local MPs have demanded the sackings of social workers and directors. It was again the social workers who got targeted, not the other agencies. So we still see social workers in the firing line and politicians lining up to take shots when they are under pressure, he says. We now know from Ed Ball's autobiography that he was under tremendous personal pressure from tabloid editors to act. The message he was given was that if he didn't do what was demanded and sack Sharon Shoesmith, he himself would be in the frame. He caved in under the pressure, that's my view, and I don't have confidence that the tabloids have changed their behavior that much or that politicians would behave any more responsibly if faced by that. End of quote. Ray Jones says there remains little understanding or recognition of the strain social workers and counselors are under, and the profession itself needs to find ways to challenge that. He cites the way teachers and police officers are currently highlighting the impact of cuts to their services. He wants social work to do the same. He also says we have to be upfront with the media and seek the opportunities to talk about the realities of what is going on. That has to be proactive, not just us responding when something awful has happened. We have to be fairly strong in telling that story about how bad and difficult it has become, certainly in parts of the country, to do the work we need to do to the standard we need to do it. Jones feels the British Association of Social Workers is becoming more willing to get out there in the public and make the case for social work helped by a growing membership and better regional representation. The BBC documentary Baby P, The Untold Story aired in October 2014. This was a study of the public and media response to the Baby P scandal and the impact on professionals. Shortly after Peter was born, his parents separated and his mother, Tracy Connolly, cared for their four children with the father continuing to see them. Tracy had already established a friendship with Stephen Barker. A number of suspicious injuries started being seen by doctors when Peter was about five months old. At the age of seven months, he was taken to the GP by Tracy, who said that he had fallen down the stairs the previous day. The GP saw he had a bruise on his breast and head. He did not consider informing the health visitor or pursuing it further. This met the threshold of the possible risk of significant harm and social services should have been informed. The response should then have been to make inquiries under Section 47 of the Children Act 1989 and to visit the home to investigate how such a young child could have fallen down the stairs and to see whether the family needed help. When Peter was eight months old, his mother's boyfriend, Stephen Barker, moved into the home, but Tracy successfully hid this fact. A month later, she took baby Peter to the GP with a swelling to his head, which she said she noticed after he had been in the care of her mother. 
a hospital referral was made and the number of bruises were found on his body and as the injuries appeared to be non-accidental, a referral was made to social workers. A strategy meeting was held the next day and the decision was made that he could not return to the family home until the Section 47 inquiries and police investigation had been completed. Tracy suggested that he could be cared for by a family friend in the meantime and social workers agreed to this. Tracy was interviewed by the police under caution but denied that she or her mother were responsible. A social work visit to the home was made presumably as part of the Section 47 inquiries but this was not recorded. An initial child protection conference was held but it was insufficiently rigorous in obtaining cru crucial information about the family circumstances and concerns. The GP was not invited, neither was a written report requested. Consequently, med medical opinion tended to be discounted and the risk of deliberate harm to Peter played down. The general view was that Peter was active and accident prone and Tracy had probably failed to protect him from accidental injuries. The arrival in the family of Stephen Barker was unknown to social workers and consequently he was not checked out. Too little significance was given to Tracy's own childhood experience of serious abuse and the possible impact of it on her own parenting. Registration of Peter was finally achieved under the categories physical abuse and neglect but the child protection plan was unhelpful in that it lacked a detailed analysis of the dangers a baby in this family was exposed to and how risks might be reduced. Although the risks were serious enough for all four children to be registered, only the two youngest ones were. These were serious injuries to a baby and the mother's denial of abuse needed an official response. It appears that social workers could have pursued legal action. A legal order would not have precluded the possibility of Peter returning, returning home at a later stage. A, compre a comprehensive assessment would then have been carried out to determine whether it would be safe for him to return to his family. If this kind of in-depth assessment had been carried out, social workers might have discovered that Stephen Barker had been suspected of torturing his grandmother and also that he spent a lot of time caring for Peter on his own. This assessment might have also challenged the prevailing view that the relationship between Tracy and her children were largely positive. It's possible that her apparent willingness to cooperate with the child protection plan provided a strong argument for allowing Peter to return home with the protection provided by registration. Another alternative would have been for Peter to return home with the protection of a supervision order and an agreement that Stephen Barker should never be given sole care of Peter. This would have sent a strong message that any physical injury to a child is unacceptable. Tracy would have been in no doubt that Peter would only remain in the family if she could protect him from further serious injuries. Peter returned home after five weeks without this important work being done. From that point onwards, the family received a range of interventions from professionals from local agencies. Tracy turned out the offer of therapy for herself but accepted the involvement of a social worker from the Family Welfare Association. The focus of much work was on improving her parenting of the children. She was referred to a mellow parenting course and attended 9 of her 14 sessions with her youngest daughter. Peter was present at some of these sessions playing in the crash. Various professionals noted that Peter was an active child who would throw his body around and headbutt family members and objects. This appeared to support Tracy's concerns that her son suffered frequent accidents due to being an active, clumsy child with a high pain threshold. The home 
Baby Peter's home was chaotic, dirty and smelly, but Tracy's laziness and lack of housework skills meant this remained an ongoing problem. She needed to be challenged, given practical advice on health and safety issues in the home and told clearly of the consequences if she did not improve her care of the children. Many risk factors existed and professionals involved should have been made fully aware of the suspicions of physical abuse. Although there were a number of events which, which should have rung alarm bells, they did not trigger appropriate interventions. Firstly, Tracy showed an unwillingness to cooperate with the social worker's request to get rid of the dogs, including a Rottweiler. Then, about four months after registration, Tracy took Peter to hospital following an injury to his head which had occurred four days before. She claimed that it was an accident and Peter didn't become unwell until that day. He was admitted to hospital for 48 hours observation. Both the hospital and the social work staff were too willing to believe the plausible accounts Tracy was offering to explain Peter's injuries and agreed to him being discharged home. Two months later, the social worker made an unannounced visit and noticed a bruise under Peter's chin. She insisted on a medical examination and this revealed multiple bruises and scratches of different ages and grab mark bruises on the leg that doctors were particularly concerned about. The social worker agreed to him being dis discharged home. Tracy had been arrested by the police and questioned about the injuries, although it was reasonable to infer that the injuries were non-accidental, the view later developed that the evidence was inconclusive. Managers took the view that they did not meet the threshold for care proceedings. A child protection review meeting was held, but the way it was handled suggested that child protection was not being given high priority. It should have recognized that there were strong grounds for removing Peter immediately and probably the other children too. And as we know, shortly after, Stephen Barker's brother, Jason Owen, moved into the home with a 15-year-old girl and three of his children. The situation in the home became even more chaotic and the harm to Peter escalated over the following five weeks. On 3rd of August 2007, two months, two months after the, after the child protection review, Peter was found dead at home. He had more than 50 injuries, including fractured ribs and a broken back. On 11th of November 2008, Jason Owen, 36 year old at the time, and Stephen Barker, 32, were found guilty of causing or allowing the death of Peter. Tracy Connolly, 27, had already pleaded guilty to this charge. Tracy Connolly was jailed for a minimum of five years, yes, five years in 2009, then she was freed on license in 2013 but she was recalled to HMP style in Cheshire 18 months later for selling indecent images of herself to perverts obsessed with her notoriety. Five years. In 2018, astonishing letters written from jail revealed how she dismissed her involvement in her son's death and detailed her friendship with mass murderer Rose West. She said that Rose West, who killed at least 10 girls with her husband Fred and buried them in their house of horrors, was helping her lose weight. Tracy also revealed that she thinks she is innocent, even though she hid Stevens and Jason's torture of her son from social workers. She also discussed in the letter baking a cake to celebrate her impending divorce. Stephen the two-year-old girl tortured his own grandmother and is suspected of SEX attacks on other children. Stephen Brothers Jason was a crack cocaine addict and convicted arsonist who was accused of raping an 11-year-old girl. The letter written from jail in 2017 reads, quote, I trusted Barker so much we got together. He is five years older than me. Then bang, him and Owen did what they did and now I'm here. I'm a good person who got stopped, 
who got stuck in a effed up situation. I don't hear from the C's, Barker and Owen. I hate them so much. I hope they never contact me again. They can rot in hell. I've been single since I came to prison. I'm still married by law, but my solicitor told me the other week that my husband has asked for a divorce. I was so happy I baked the cake. I'm in no need to have another relationship because I think I need to find out who I am. It is good that my friends have stood by me. These people choose to be at my side in my darkest of hours. After all that has been said about me, yet they are still there. With their support, I hope to come out of this situation a lot stronger. Me and Rose live on the same wing. She is teaching me how to cook better food instead of junk and we play Scrabble. People said we were in a relationship, but where they got the idea I'm a lesbian is beyond me. It's a shame people believe that rubbish. I'm not sure I will get married again. I can't see me trust anyone enough for a long while. It would be nice to put my past behind me and have a fresh start. End of quote. Yeah, and to me, it just seems like she's uh, trying to portray herself as a victim here. Like, no, it wasn't my fault. If it wasn't for Steven and Jason, this wouldn't have happened. Yeah, in all that letter, this is everything I'm seeing. And uh, I'm also seeing the fact that she just wants to move forward with her life and forget about her past. But there is absolutely no remorse shown here about what happened with Baby P. On the morning of 30th of March 2022, the parole board decision over Tracy Connolly came. This is her fourth review by the parole board since she was jailed. The decision was meant to be made last year but had been delayed pending more reports and information. And again guys, another shocker, brace yourselves. But in the afternoon, Justice Secretary Dominic Raab told the House of Commons he plans to appeal against the parole board's decision that recommends Tracy should be released from prison. In a statement, a spokesperson for the parole board said, quote, We can confirm that the panel of the parole board has directed the release of Tracy Connolly following an oral hearing. Parole board decisions are solely focused on what risk a prisoner could, rep could represent to the public if released and whether that risk is manageable in the community. Parole reviews are undertaken thoroughly and with extreme care. Protecting the public is our number one priority. End of quote. Last year, it was reported that Tracy may have to agree to undergo lie detector tests to prove that she is not reoffending. The parole board considered her case for a third time in 2019, following previous reviews in 2015 and 2017, and refused to either release her of or move her to an open prison. In 2020, she lost an appeal against the latest parole board decision not to release her. Uh, the shockers keep on piling on this case, guys. As of May 2022, which is last month, Tracy Connolly has been advised to lose weight and dye her hair when she is released from prison in a few weeks' time, as she won't be given a new identity. Baby P's mother, if I can even call her that, who allegedly weighs almost 20 stone after 13 years behind bars, has been advised to disguise her appearance by going on a crash diet and dyeing her hair. She was informed she will be freed without police protection, despite fearing she'll be targeted by vigilantes. A prison source said, quote, Tracy was fuming when she heard the news. It is very rare to give prisoners a new identity. The bar is extremely high and she did not cross that threshold. End of quote. Tracy Connolly is being prepared for freedom from HMP Low Newton County Durham after the parole board ruled that she was not a danger to the public despite attempts by Justice Secretary Dominic Raab to block her release. She is expected to be sent to a bail hostel that houses high-risk female offenders. After it was announced that she was set to be released, Mr. Raab 
called for a fundamental overhaul of the parole board. Yes, she's being released. He described the actions of Tracy as pure evil. Mr. Rupp said, quote, the decision to release her demonstrate why the parole board needs a fundamental overhaul, including a ministerial check for the most serious offenders so that it serves and protects the public. Tracy Connolly claimed she was paranoid she will be knifed by her fellow inmates after the parole board agreed to free her. Yeah, 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 yeah. As of now, 7th of June 2022, when I uh, made the research for the video, is still unknown if she was already released. Mary O'Connor said that her daughter Tracy Connolly should not be allowed out of prison despite the parole board's decision to grant her freedom. She said her daughter will not have changed and urged that she remains behind bars. Mary, who is suffering from cancer, told the son, quote, she needs to be in jail for life. She shouldn't be out. She won't have changed to so let her out for what she did. You have to be joking. End of quote. Speaking about the possibility of an appeal, Mary told the paper, I'd love to go up to him and say, don't let her out. She's a B. Peter died because of her. A source told the Mirror, the publicity around her parole has provoked renewed anger towards her in the prison. She's a marked woman again after keeping her head down for years. Tracy believes she will be knifed and is almost afraid to venture out of her cell. But a former prisoner who served time with Tracy in Agent Pillow Newton in Durham City said that no one could ever get close enough to harm her. Julie McAllister, who spent time with Tracy in prison, said that her claims of fear are an attempt to get a new identity after her release. The 44-year-old from Newcastle also revealed how she struggled to control her own rage when she watched Tracy laugh and joke during a prison reading group session. Julie said, quote, it's absolute rubbish that people would try to attack her. No one would get a chance. She's a very manipulative woman. There is no chance of anybody being able to get to her. She's very manipulative and that's what she's doing now. According to Julie, Tracy Connolly and other women convicted of serious crimes against children, another shocker here, okay, are kept segregated in a different ring from other inmates at HMP Lone Newton. And she says, it's a constant source of anger that the most evil prisoners live in the best conditions. No wonder they never learn their lessons. Quote, you never even see them, she said. She's in F-wing. It's self-contained flats. They are all in for murders or harming children. One left her baby to die. People talk about them, but no one can get near them. They get the best conditions, but they have committed the worst crimes. They have their own flats with showers and carpets. If you kill kids, you are laughing, it seems. End of quote. Julie, who once punched serial child killer Rose West in the face in the prison's dining hall, was released from her most recent sentence at Lone Newton very recently. When she was in jail, she once came face to face with Tracy Connolly when they both joined the prison's reading group. And she describes how she and other inmates watched in anger as controlling Tracy laughed and joked and shouted orders at others. Quote, she's an evil woman. I'm a mom myself. And to think of what she's done is horrific, she said. I have seen how she manipulates people. I signed up for a reading group and she decided to come. She's fat with thick hair. She's very, very loud and very manipulative. She was dictating to other prisoners. She would just look at the book and say, get me that book. She was treating people like puppets. She was laughing her head off and I just thought, how can you have done something like that to a baby and be laughing? If I had ever hurt a baby, I wouldn't be able to laugh for the rest of my life. Seeing her laughing just made me mad. 
I had to stop myself from jumping over the table. But you have to be nice to her in prison because you don't want to lose your privileges. In 2019, the Daily Star Sunday reported that Tracy's daughter has pleaded with the board to keep her behind bars. The concerned woman allegedly wrote to the parole board advising them against freeing her. She said too that she doesn't believe her mom feels sorry for allowing Peter to be tortured to death. It's believed that Tracy, who has three daughters, was keen to be released as soon as possible to spend Christmas with her lover. An insider told the star, quote, it is a real blow to her bid for freedom and she was hoping things would sail through this time. She has very much kept herself to herself in the run-up to, to this hearing, but now she is having to face opposition from her own family. She is worried her own kid wanting her to stay away will be a real shock to those deciding her fate, end of quote. So even then, she wasn't even concerned about her daughter. She was more concerned about how she will be perceived because of her daughter speaking out to the parole board. You can clearly see there that she is not feeling remorseful and prison didn't really change her. Last March, Stephen Barker had his parole be refused and was told he must, he must remain in high security prison for refusing to confront his crimes. He was jailed for causing or allowing the death of a child in 2007. The decision was made after the panel heard evidence from psychiatrists and prison officials who said Stephen, who shows no remorse, failed to address his sickening urges. According to the Sun, the panel was told that his risk, that his risk factors included the impact on him of past life experiences, his capacity to become sensually aroused towards very young children, not being able to control extreme emotions, and his difficulties in relationships. Jason Owen, Stephen's brother, got a minimum three years but returned to jail briefly in 2013 after a parole breach. He is believed to be living under a new identity. Now, I'm not sure exactly what the practice around here in the UK is in terms of houses where murders happened. From the cases that I covered from the UK, the houses were demolished, but it seems that the house where baby Peter tragically lost his life is not demolished. And now here comes yet another shocker. I have no idea how many times I repeated this throughout this video, but here is another shocker, guys. So again, brace yourselves. When Anthony Bond was offered a four-bedroom house for his growing family, he was just delighted. However, soon after moving into the house, Anthony and his girlfriend were shocked to learn they were living in a house of horror. Their new home was the place where toddler Peter Connolly was tortured to death. 42-year-old Anthony and his partner, 30-year-old Colleen Beck, who had just given birth to their son Ronnie say they were cursed from that moment. The couple were petrified they would be attacked by vigilantes who believed they were the killers and planned to fire them. Anthony says that the pressures of trying to protect his family led to him losing his job and the, as a painter and decorator and he turned to drink in despair. Colleen plunged into depression after realizing she looked after her newborn baby on the same sofa where Peter was repeatedly attacked before his death at the age of 17 months. And she says that her eldest son was bullied by kids who believed he was from Britain's most notorious family at the time. In the end, the couple's relationship fell apart and Anthony blames the house of evil in North London. He said, quote, it totally ruined our lives. No one told us that it was the house where Peter was killed. If they had, we'd never have moved in. It should have been a lovely time. Colleen came straight from having Ronnie in hospital and moved into the house. I would decorated the nursery exactly how we would dreamed of having it. Then, a few days later, we found out that poor little boy had been killed there. It sends a shiver down my spine." End of quote. 
When one of their neighbors knocked on the door and told Anthony there was something he needed to know about the house, he was thinking that the woman was just being nosy and explained that they just had a newborn and needed some time alone. But the woman didn't stop and she put a letter through the door telling them the truth about their dream home. One year before the family arrived in August 2008, baby Peter was murdered in that very house. Anthony recalled, quote, I hadn't heard that much about the case as the people who killed Peter weren't convicted until November 2008, but people who lived locally knew what had happened. End of quote. Herringy Council leased the house from property management firm Glass Mode, but after Peter's death, they handed it back. Anthony said, our landlord claims that all Herringy Council told him was that a baby had died of cot death. Although we obviously found that to be very sad, we didn't see it as a reason not to move in. But when we found out what had really happened, we were horrified. A TV crew came round one day and confirmed the story. And from that moment, our world fell apart. End of quote. Colleen said that she found it particularly harrowing knowing that her baby had slept in the same bedroom as Peter and sat on the same sofa. She said, I was going through a very emotional time and as any new mom does and knowing that a poor defenseless little baby had died in such a horrible way sent me into a total decline. I became very depressed and, Ant and Anthony didn't want to leave me as he was worried someone might confront me. People would stare at us in the street and whisper. They thought we were the killers. I was terrified. I didn't want to stay in the house as it was so eerie, but I was scared to go out. It was a living hell. Because of the pressure we were under, Anthony started drinking more and I would cry myself to sleep at night. It was horrendous, end of quote. The couple had been desperate for a home because they were living apart with relatives as Ronnie's birth approached. Anthony worked for Glass Mode, who told him that the house was available. He said, quote, When I first went to view the house, it was disgusting. There were kids' clothes all over the floor mixed in with porn magazines and dog masks. But the council called in cleaners and when we moved in, we decorated and made it nice. For a young family, it was great with four decent sized bedrooms, a big garden and a double garage. We felt lucky. The only thing there from the old tenants was the sofa. Now, when I look at photos of Colleen, Ronnie and me on it, I shiver. There was also a banister by the stairs and I remember having a horrid feeling about it and taking it off the wall. I later learned that Peter had his back broken by being slammed into it. End of quote. Colin said, I have two sons who were only four and eight at the time and I had to explain something bad had happened in our house. My eldest was bullied at school over it. It was our worst nightmare. End of quote. Then police discovered vigilantes were planning to fire from the house. After nearly three weeks there, the couple were moved to another house nearby, but people still believed that they were the killers because Tracy and Stephen had not been named for legal reasons. In May the following year, all three of them were convicted of causing Peter's death. They were then named and jailed. But for Anthony and Colleen, and Colleen, who had been together two years, it was, it was too late. The shattered couple separated and Colleen went back to her hometown of Blackpool with her two older sons, while Anthony lives in Anfield, North London, with Ronnie, now three. The couple still see each other and Anthony hopes to move to Blackpool in the new year to revive their love. But Colleen said, quote, it's been three years of utter hell and I think all our problems go back to that house, end of quote. A spokesperson for Herringy, for Herringy Council said, quote, this is a private property and was led by private agents 
who are fully aware of the police investigation. The house was empty and sealed for almost a year until August 2008 when police returned it to the agents. Given the absence of a tenant for such a prolonged period and the fact that the media had gained access and filmed the property when it was empty, it's inconceivable the landlord did not know the full circumstances. We do not know why he has allegedly explained the situation to the tenants in such a way. After baby Peter's death, the council was not involved in letting out the property at all. The council helped move the family on police advice, end of quote. Few can ever forget the cruelty and brutality inflicted on little Peter Connolly, known as Baby P. He suffered 50 injuries, including a broken back. His mother, Tracy Connolly, was jailed in 2009 after admitting causing or allowing the death of her 17-month-old son. Baby P had received 60 visits from social workers, police and health professionals. But this contentious case is sparking new outrage. Two months ago, as the parole board decided she should be released, the Justice Secretary asked them to reconsider. I should inform the House that having carefully read the decision, I've decided to apply to the parole board to seek their reconsideration. Today, as they rejected the government's challenge against their ruling, Mr Raab tweeted, Tracy Connolly's cruelty towards her son, baby Peter, was pure evil. The decision to release her demonstrates why the parole board needs a fundamental overhaul, including a ministerial check for the most serious offenders, so that it serves and protects the public. As various serious case reviews analyse the tragic life of baby P, Connolly was let out of prison on licence by 2013. She was recalled in 2015 for breaching her parole conditions. Legal experts say the parole board will have considered the onslaught of media attention and scrutiny she's about to receive. Where uh, media and public outrage come into it is actually considering the protection of that individual, you know, uh, and uh, stopping that individual, you know, uh, from being a victim of uh, harm as a result of vigilantes, etc., uh, etc., et and how that may impact that person's well-being once they're in the community and how they go in to react. Connolly could now be free within weeks, but she will face restrictions on where she goes and who she contacts. Julian Drucker, 5 News. Tracy Connolly's release could cost taxpayers £12,500 after she's being released, on top of fees for a makeover, probation officers and a psychologist to care for her. Yeah, she will, she will allegedly be released with 20 new license conditions. They are expected to include wearing an electronic tag, a curfew, and having her mobile and web use monitored. A Ministry of Justice source told Mail Online that Tracy could live in the bail hostel for up to 12 weeks, which could cost taxpayers £12,500. She will also receive care from probation officers, a psychologist and ho hostel workers topping up the bill. The most high profile released prisoners could cost even more because of security and other factors, with the exact cost of her probation only clear after her release. She will also be given a makeover so people don't recognize her and a new surname adding further costs for taxpayers. In terms of benefits, she could also receive up to up to 324 pounds a month in universal credit. Tracy was allegedly placed on the psychologically informed plant environment unit at Low Newton in 2015, according to the Sun. Places on the 20 bed unit cost about 3,000 pounds a prisoner a year. An extra cost could be the release itself. When she was released in 2013, it was alleged that she was helped out of the jail in a convoy of vehicles carrying dummy obese women. Sources said that extra vehicles containing women of a similar weight with their faces covered could also be used to throw anyone keen to follow her off the scent. The same ploy was used when Maxine Carr left prison. In 2004, when Maxine left Foston Hall Prison in Derbyshire, she was towed in the footwell of a car 
at the same time as several similar vehicles also left its and quite honestly it's a shame that we spend this much money on killers but we never have enough for saving children from dying a horrible death and to think that Tracy said she never knew baby P was being tortured is just is just beyond shocking she claimed that she didn't know yet baby P was living with her in the same house day in and day out how can she say that she didn't know bruises injuries pain fear were those so invisible that she just didn't notice? I mean, quite honestly, I, I just don't buy that. They also used to smear chocolate on baby P's face to hide the bruises. So I am not convinced at all that she didn't know. She knew very well. But I think that she just decided to carry on. And then I'm also thinking, Stephen, he was charged for of a two-year-old girl along with Tracy right is it possible that this two-year-old girl lived with them in the house maybe she was one of baby P's sister or one of Jason's child it's uh, it's quite a bit it's a bit strange because you know they live together Tracy and Jason they got charged together which leads me in a way to think that it was perhaps one of baby P's sisters but of course don't quote me on that because I really couldn't find the um, information as to who the girl was. It's just no, I'm thinking, I'm just thinking that perhaps they lived in the same house because that's the only explanation as to how Tracy got involved as well. And it's heartbreaking to say that some people, they just don't deserve to have children. And those who do, sometimes they can't have any or they are taken away for no reason whatsoever. Thank you guys for watching today's case thank you guys so much for watching today's video i know it was a, a hard one but i think that baby p deserves his story to be heard and told again thanks for watching take care stay safe and i will see you in the next one bye